It is now our pleasure to introduce keynote speaker, Sheila Talo. As I describe her work, you'll see how she epitomizes the summit's theme, Beyond Boundaries. As director of the UNAIDS Regional Support Team for Eastern and Southern Africa, based in Johannesburg, Dr. Talo is uniquely positioned to kick off the 2016 summit as she speaks on global health policy and solutions to challenges. In her current position, she provides leadership in the response to HIV AIDS and ensures technical support to United Nations teams in 21 countries. Her pioneering work has earned her the coveted designation of United Nations eminent person for women, girls, and HIV AIDS in Southern Africa. Dr. Tolo is a former member of the Botswana Parliament and was Minister of Health from 2004 to 2009. She was a professor of nursing and director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery Development in Primary Healthcare for Anglophone Africa at the University of Botswana. Dr. Talo has been involved in the AIDS response since 1985 and founded the Botswana chapter of the Society of Women and AIDS in Africa. As Botswana's Minister of Health, she led a forward thinking and focused HIV prevention and treatment and care and support program, which is still referred to as a model today. As chair of the Southern African Development Community, SADC, and the African Union Ministers of Health, she provided leadership in the adoption of the SADC Malaria Eradication Program, the SADC HIV AIDS Plan of Action, and the Maputo Plan of Action on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. She also represented Eastern and Southern Africa on the board of the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Professor Tulu holds a PhD in nursing sciences and postgraduate certificates in women's health and gender studies from the University of Illinois in Chicago. She has authored many publications on gender and HIV and has received many national and international awards. Colleagues, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tulu to the stage. Thank you very much. Babe, was this box just for you? <laughs> or am I allowed to step on it? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, you filled up rather quickly. Good evening. Well, I'm the one that's jet lagging here. I should be the one that's going. Good evening. Good evening. All right. All right. I feel like I'm, I'm now at home. OK. Um, thank you very much, uh, and, and, and Bev. And uh, the whole NLN family for welcoming me with your warm arms. I've been greeted by so many people and with such high expectations, like it's like, oh my God, will I really make it? But anyway, hey, we're going to talk, right? And I have only 45 minutes. I really have to time myself because I'm a politician in the ultimate and politicians are paid to talk so I may go overboard. However, I'm also a nurse. 
and nurses are paid to be brief and to the point. So I'll, I'll try to balance the two. Okay, so um, I, I feel very welcome. It's great for me to be here. And I really want to thank uh, uh, the president and the CEO and the board of directors for inviting me, for seeing to it that they should invite these women from far away over here. And guess what? The letter that I got from Mbabie, I read it and I responded within five minutes because it was written Orlando, Florida. And it was like, wow, did they say Orlando? And right away I responded and said, I accept. Why? This is a place that I've come to. This is probably what my eighth visit. All the time when I was Minister of Health, any stress that I experienced, December or July, I'd be here just to relax, play with mice, and be in a place where nobody knows me. So for me, it's really great that, of course, now I'm here and now people know me. That, you know, that's, that's the bad part, but the good part is that we are now together. And I came with my family. They are right here, stand up so they can see you. That's my, my daughter, Maloko. That's my sister, Monkey. And that's my daughter-in-law, Bango. So all the way. They, they, they are my inspiration. So, you know, women inspiring others, and I'm hoping that I'm lifting as I'm climbing, and I can see how, you know, that's rubbing off on them. So thank you very much for welcoming me. So um, let's see. Well, I was given something that's like beyond boundaries, and I thought, well, you know, for me, it means two things. Okay, global health as mandated by the Sustainable Development Goals, that's SDGs, but also looking at beyond boundaries, meaning that the, what used to be the role of the nurse, like, you know, is now, we, we're now going beyond, and we're saying in this world, how do we expand and be nursing and caring in other uh, areas? So that I'm looking at it on both those angles. Uh, where do I point this? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. So that's my main goal, really to, to share. My, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be as brief on this as possible because I would like to to us to talk. It should be a conversation. So I'm going to to just share my own personal pers you know experiences, perspectives on what it means by being a global citizen, and really the fact that local is global and global is local. Um, going back. In our training, and I'm sure now we have nurse educators, right, who are here, who have, who have taught, but most of the time they emphasized systems. We were never taught that the planet that we are in, Earth, is a closed system. And that whatever happens in one part of that planet actually does affect the other. So it's only now that we are now talking, oh, global is local. Why? Because of the environment. The fact that any pesticide sprayed in Chile can affect the fish and every ecology in Australia and vice versa. So that it's really that concept of us as global citizens and how we care, therefore, beyond what we think are our boundaries, but also how we care beyond what we think should be the scope of nursing. We used to be told the scope of nursing, but now there's really caring, integrity, you know, innovation should be everywhere. So really that, that, that's what I'm hoping I'll be able to share with you. But my expectation is really that the younger people, the older people, that's fine, that's fine, you are set like me. But I'm hoping that this will inspire younger nurse educators and nurses to really now know that beyond the niche Beyond that niche, they can actually have a niche in primary health care, but within the sustainable development goals. So we'll talk about those because they too, there are 17 of them with 169 targets, and they are relevant. All of them are relevant to us as nurses, as nurse educators, not just SDG 3, which has to do with health. A lot of people will usually say, well, no, no, no. Ours is only health. No. All 17 are ours, and all the 169 targets are ours. 
so uh, beyond the scope of nursing. There is Sheila. Just recently, underground in a mine, I had gone there to see the situation of people who are working underground, miners, but also to show ensure that if there's anybody who's interested in caring within the underground environment, they should have that chance. Because underground is actually a city. You go there 200 meters, and then you are in a completely different environment. So there I was trying my skill at being a miner, uh, digging for gold, so to speak. And uh, I, at least I am now assured that one day when I, when I retire, which will be soon, I can always go underground and be a miner. Yeah, but <laughs> so anyway, but you know, within that environment, let's just look at now when we're talking about the SDGs and the fact that the Earth is one planet. Let's look at that global context. Right now, I'm sure this water was com is, comes from a bottle. Where, because nobody now knows what it is we are drinking. There is that, you know, that kind of degradation of land and water resources. And we're having the natural disasters. Just recently in Uganda, I wrote that Uganda 9-11, 2016, you know, on the 11th, there was an earthquake in Tanzania. Now, Africa has never experienced earthquakes, but now we're experiencing them. Tanzania was hit by a six point something, 6.4 magnitude, um, you know, earthquake. And we in Uganda, was in Uganda visiting right then. We felt it. The little bit of disaster preparedness training that I got actually did not help me that much. <laughs> you know, you are on the fourth floor of a building and you, you feel it shaking, tiki, 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 and you're thinking, what's that? And somebody says, an earthquake. I look out and people are running. The only thing I could do was to say, hey, sit down, don't run. But then I'm thinking, but I'm here and I'm shaking. I didn't know what to do. So I had somebody, I was with the queen of Toro, they grabbed that and shoved us under, under a table. And then, I mean, that, that was like a shake of maybe four minutes, but it looked like it was an hour because we didn't know what to do. Fortunately, it was short enough that, uh, and we were shopping, so after that we continued with our shopping without thinking of it. But you know, oh, when it's, it's like this, nurses are usually the first on site. And therefore, we need to be that proactive. We need to be able to ensure that our students are prepared in disaster preparedness. It's really that. The epidemics, you know, how global are we? We are so global that Ebola was not a, that much of a problem until it crossed the Atlantic. Then it became a problem. You know, we had long been saying, oh, we are trying to merge Ivella and HIV, oh, both. Uh, but immediately crossed the Atlantic and entered America, it became now a problem. So that now we know we are looking at vaccine research for Ebola, everything. And I think it really does show us that there is nothing like it affects only them. Look at Zika. We thought it would stay in Brazil. No, it's everywhere. So that we need that kind of caring, that kind of transparency, that kind of integrity the very, very values that we all have. That kind of diversity that's saying, how do we then ensure that we collaborate with others outside? So we're looking at weak health systems too, but most of the time, we are looking at human rights violations uh, of people, you know, migrants and all that. We need to be able to care for migrants because we have too many people left behind in healthcare. Apart from that, we also have the man-made disasters, and I mean these were made by real men, as in beard, you know, as in armed conflict, internal strife, but guess what? They do it, nurses are the ones who get the brunt of it. So we need to be able to, 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 to really prepare our, 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 uh, our people on that. Now, globally, who are the most people left behind? I was glad to see some of your posters, seeing the vulnerable groups, the elderly, and all that. But we have uh, 12 populations that we identified as UNAs, as people who are left behind. Among them, adolescents, prisoners, migrants, you know, people with disabilities, but also the marginalized people in society, namely sex workers, men who have sex with men, drug users. I want to challenge at this point the NLN for your next 
convention in San Diego, could we have sessions for sex workers, not by other people, but by sex workers themselves, to be able to tell you what it is they need, what kind of care, what kind of support they need. It will really be uh, you know, uh, a, a, a great learning event, and I think one of the, our values that we have is lifelong learning. So let's do some lifelong learning. San Diego is the best place to have them. Men, we have sex with men, and, re and really that. Because I know even among ourselves, there are still some people who have their own thing. Like, where the hell do they come from? And you say, no, they are ours. You know, I usually say to our presidents, these are our children. They deserve the same dignity as everybody else. They said they deserve the same rights to health care, and we need to give it to them. And there is no way we can, they can have that if they are continually being discriminated, marginalized, and sometimes even persecuted. You know, so it's, it's, it's really that. So we need to have that you know, kind of attention where we, we, we look at people uh, in terms of reduction of stigma, discrimination, social, uh, uh, exclusion, social exclusion, and also caring beyond boundaries. That's exactly what it was. When we were training, we were told that MSM and all that, was, that was abnormal psychology. Uh, we don't have that anymore because we know that those people are as normal as us and they just have, happen to have a different sexual orientation. So they were really saying, should anybody be left behind? Not according to primary health care. You know, our Bible should still be the primary health care Bible. That Alma Atta declaration is still as relevant now as it was a long time ago. And it's really saying all health care should be accessible, affordable, acceptable, and universal. And that's where the concept of universal health care is so important. Now, I don't know now, uh, you know, with uh, the, your, the, the, the people who are running for presidency, what have they said in terms of health care for people, in terms of universal health care? But it would be interesting to see in that debate, you know, we should not just be focusing on foreign policy. It should be also the policy of the Americas here. What are you going to do about health care? How universal will it be? And all that. So anyway, in Botswana, we are lucky. We, were, we actually, after we discovered diamonds, we, we embraced this uh, concept of primary health care long even before the Alma Atta declaration. And guess who was the backbone of the health care system? Nurses. They became the backbone. They still are. And uh, I wish they could be in, you know, remunerated even more, but they still are and we are having great wonders. I myself, all the things that uh, Bev said, I did them because I work with nurses. Nurse practitioners were the ones initiating patients on antiretroviral treatment, following up patients and doing everything that could have been done by what we call a medical doctor. Why? Because at that time, we didn't have any medical doctors. So that the nurses showed that they are just as capable as anybody. And we had a, a great thing that even now I'm telling other ministers in the country to say, did you say you don't have enough people to initiate people on therapy? And they say, yes, I say, where are the nurses? And they're looking at me with cross eyes like nurses. I say, yes, nurses, train them, they will initiate. And we are seeing great wonders, that's right. So it's, it's, it's really great. So that was a great success, but I got interested in it from a human rights gender perspective. And then that score actually, I want to thank the National League for Nursing because I was your student from day one. Dillard University, New Orleans, Catholic University of America, uh, the Columbia University in New York, and lastly, University of Illinois at Chicago, still under the care of the NLN. See what you produced? Hey, give yourself a hand. And that's where I got all that. So anyway, but I got interested, but what it entailed was really, if you are going to advocate on a global environment, you need political activism. For AIDS, we made our business to understand the science behind the disease, even before, while the researchers were, were studying it. But not only that, 
everybody had to be a leader. When we are taught about leadership in school, we are just applying the principles that we have taught, that everybody in the ultimate has some influence and they can be a leader. So that we used everybody, whether it's a young person, a traditional leader, a chief or whatever, to just ensure that they spread the message and they can advocate. But most important was that realization that global is local. What is happening globally should be able to happen, especially if it's a good thing, should be able to happen in our environment. Remember when um, there was a discovery of uh, AIDS, uh, the treatment, um, we attended a, 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 um, a conference in Vancouver, and over there it was like, well, this may not be relevant in Africa because one, they don't have time, they don't have watches, they can't tell the time. So, and I remember saying to somebody, listen, when I took my medication when the sun is here, the following day I'm taking that medication when the sun is still there, that's time, you know. So really, I don't know what you are talking about. So, so, that, so that when I became minister, my thing was to prove to the West, not to anybody, to the West that yes, treatment, we can save lives even in a resource limited setting. And we did. So we became one of those where it's like, oh, okay. But not only that, we really wanted to ensure accountability for whatever political commitment and also lifting as we climb, inspiring a new generation. So if anybody asks you, what does this entail? It actually entails that, those really ensuring that you spread that leadership. Okay, now, personal role as an academic is really, you know, what does what the gender activist role and all that. It was not easy. I'm looking at it now, it's like, yeah, we did this, and I know it wasn't that easy. You know, just knowledge, but the, what we may, were able to demonstrate was that knowledge is power. Just through research, documenting, you know, that and having that documentation at ICPD, the, the Population Development in 94, and Beijing. In Beijing, they were telling us that, no, 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 this HIV is for, uh, you know, uh, men who have, for homosexuals. And we said in America, in Africa, it's for heterosexuals. Here we are, and here's the evidence. So that helped a lot. And um, as uh, the director of the uh, WHO Collaborating Center, that was the 22 countries, we made sure, I made sure that I trained, I educated nurses as gender scholars. And it paid off because now in all the countries I go to, most of my students are the AIDS coordinators. In my own country, when I became a minister, I needed a coordinator in each and every ministry, whether it's agriculture, foreign affairs, education, and guess who got those positions? The nurses because they were the ones trained as ACE coordinators. So that was what the power of knowing and really, and, and, and that's how come we were able to carry it forth because we had people who were now committed and who knew what it was all about. But the most important thing is that, you know, the community is always important in primary health care. They were my source of support as a minister because I was able to say, what did we say we know and how do we take it forth? What don't we know? And can we know it? Because at that time, we could not wait for anybody. When we did the provider-initiated HIV counseling and testing, nobody else in the world was doing that. But we sat down and said, look, we have all the paraphernalia. We have the drugs. We have everything. But people are not coming. So what do we do? We said, let's have provider-initiated voluntary counseling and testing. If you came in, we didn't care whether you had a broken hand or what. There was somebody there living with HIV who said, I know my status. Would you like to know yours? And somebody said, what does a broken hand have to do with HIV? And they said, well, just so you know your status. And as a result, as I'm talking to you now, Botswana is the only country actually in the world where 90% of the inhabitants know their HIV status. That's right. So when we talk 90, 90, 90, I usually say Botswana has reached that, you can get it too. That's right. So uh, we've already talked about the HIV program. 
The one thing being that when we talk about primary prevention for young people, I had a life skills uh, curriculum with the Ministry of Education, which now we are spreading throughout the region because we found it helps. It helps, ignorance is not bliss. And a lot of parents at that time wanted to keep their children ignorant, but we were able to show them that no, you don't, you, you know, we work with them. So now, the what we call comprehensive sexuality education is actually in every country in Eastern and Southern Africa. So now, our, our mandate as nurses, nurse educators, are the sustainable development goals. We need to find a niche in there. Number three is good health. But if you look at all, all of them, from poverty, through energy, through hunger, all the way to even peace and justice, nurses have a role there. And it's just a question of developing our needs. So we need to educate our students on what the sustainable development goals are. Because these are here forever. Unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were really for developing countries like ours, these are for everybody. So that we can find a niche in there and be that nurse who is taking care of life below water, SDG number 14. So we, 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 we need that. But our mandate, if you are going to look at health, is actually right there. Now, I like number three, ending epidemics, but also number four, reducing non-communicable diseases, you know, mortality. Because right now we're dealing with those non-communicable diseases, and we need to ensure that we promote even that, but also the mental health and well-being of our people. So I'm not going to, some of them, I mean, that are right there. Now, we, because of that, we had to sit down and do a political declaration on ending AIDS, which was adopted by our heads of state, including your head of state, Barack Obama. That they, the, the main message behind it is that in the absence of a cure, the only vaccine that we have against HIV and AIDS is to keep girls in school, to educate young, young girls, especially to, have, to let them have the skills to be able to work for themselves because anyone who is financially dependent on somebody cannot negotiate safe sex. So is that, is also to ensure that while they're in school, they are supported to remain in school, to have comprehensive sexuality education, to ensure that they are free from gender-based violence and most important, especially in my part of the world, to end child marriages. Those are the things that I'm now working on, child ending child marriages. Not a very popular topic, but I don't mind going to any one head of state and telling them just because you married a 14-year-old doesn't mean that it's still relevant now. Let's see how we change this whole scenario. Otherwise, your country will be left behind. So we have that. But you. Know, we need to eliminate infections among children, and that's the only way we can be able to, to really end AIDS, because the, 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 the mandate now is ending AIDS as a public health threat by the year 2030. So, what should we do? Uh, ending all forms of violence against women, leadership by young people, but also, as I said, universal health coverage and social product pr protection so that we have the cancers, the non-communicable diseases, the emerging diseases like Zika and the ones that are re-emerging. We need to ensure that we are well versed with those and our students are able to care in all that uh, capacity. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a, a case for universal health coverage, which is really to say that the current World Bank and World Health Organization target is really to say that by 2030, all populations, independent of household income or place of residence, should have at least 80% of essential health coverage and they should have financial protection from out-of-pocket expenses. It means caring for migrants. It means caring for refugees because if you don't, what they have in this global community, 
you will eventually have. I usually say to my, uh, to my countries, it's either you, they say, but it's so expensive. And I say, you either pay now or you pay later. That's right. So choose. That's right. So it's basically that. Is it affordable? Yes, it is. What we need is really to increase domestic resources. A lot of our countries said they would devote 15% of their uh, the budgets to health. They have not yet done so. That alone can solve a few issues. We need to, you know, when we are, especially when we're educating, to ensure that we improve the healthcare system and reduce the waste. Because it's already been established that just the waste within the healthcare system it, 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 it accounts for 40%, more than 40% of the, uh, of the resources. That could have been saved. But not only that, unmotivated healthcare workers overuse of medicines and technologies. And I know in our country, this very country, that happens a lot. So we can, through shared responsibility and the global solidarity, ensure that we, we join that innovation, that you know, diversity, that cultural uh, you know, diversity to ensure that we, 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 we do look at how, as a global community, we can be able to afford universal health coverage for everybody. So, however, let me now conclude. Uh, we'll still talk, but what are our educator roles as far as I'm concerned? Knowledge is power, and I want to congratulate the NLN because you are giving awards on research. Those research awards are very important. We need to really focus on those, so it's really great. But we need to ensure that we, our power is not through opinion, but through evidence. But not only that, we need to now know and monitor the implementation of all the global commitments, especially the Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, and you now have an election coming. Uh, your people, your two people, savvy with the develop Sustainable Development Goals, what are they going to do about them and all that. But we need to promote, engage communities, civil society. I said community-based responses and said Malawi success. I worked with the traditional leaders in Malawi, about 15 leaders, and their final declaration was that no child will be born, will be, will be in, no child will be married under the age of 18 in their communities. And, and the great part, the great part was that it was not just a declaration. They're actually implementing it. And I'm sure if you Google now, there is a chief, a female chief, who is famous to have stopped, within a period of a year, she has stopped over a thousand marriages and sent those girls back to school. So we want people who are like that to say, no, nope, she's not going to get married, back to school and uh, until she finishes. So we want that kind of productivity. And we know once we involve the traditional leaders, you are right there because the community loves them and all that. But ultimately, we need to use all power, especially access to power, corridors of power. If you know people among you who have access to, let's say, Donald Trump, hey, use them so that they can be able to see how you penetrate that. You, 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 you we need people who can access corridors of power. I made sure that it was my responsibility to, to access corridors of power. But then I was a civil society activist, so that when I came back, let's say from a conference such as this, I'd go over and say new information to the president. New information says we need to do one, two, three. And he says, but can it be done? I say, yeah, we can. Civil society, society for women and AIDS, we can do it. And he say, go ahead and do it. So we need that kind of access. And I'm still using it now. Here is my access to corridors of power. These are the ministers of health of the SADC, the Southern African Development Community, all 15 of them. And I was working with them, actually, to ensure that they, and they, they, they make sure that legislation against girl-child marriage is there in, in, in their country. Uh, fortunately, none of these countries practice FGM, the female genital mutilation. But even then, it was ready to say, let's make sure that we include any cultural practice 
that would predispose the girl child and the boy child to harm. So there they are. Those are the ministers, and I, you know, I was able to sit down with them and really go through. Nee, 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 nee. That's what we, we mean access. Yeah. But lastly, uh, we we need you to be advocates. Let's identify interprofessional and intraprofessional, you know, global collaboration. We I know some of you have student ex, uh, exchanges. Okay, we need to expand those so that our students can be able to learn from students from another state, but not only that, students from another country, not only that, students from another continent completely. We, I know it means money, but you know what? It's a drop in the ocean. If you are able to send two students, that's two, you know, and those will do as much, you know, good as when you are sent 10, because when they come back, they are ambassadors. So be a leader. Being, leadership is not easy. It encompasses a lot of challenges. All the things that Bevel was saying was doing were not easy. You, you end up having people who don't understand you and think you are being too radical, or they make you a minister to shut you up. I think when I was made a minister, it was more, let's shut her up. And I didn't. They opened a can of worms. But, uh, you know, so the, it's, it's really that. But we need to mentor. We need to inspire, we need to motivate other nurses and future nurses. I'm taking that a lot of you are going, we are going to interact and we'll be able to really inspire each other with our stories. But most important, let's make sure that we have a few nurses and nurse educators in political office. Can we? In political office to ensure good governance, gender rights-based services, to ensure just like especially the, those core values of diversity, of uh, you know, caring. Of, that's the only way we can do it. But I usually end up by saying, think of the very first man. When God found Adam and Eve naked after they had uh, eaten the apple, God said to Adam, what have you done? Adam could have said, the snake made us do it. He could have said anything, but guess what he said? The woman that you gave me made me do it. Listen, men never spoke for us then. They never will. So we need to be there. We need to be there ourselves. So let's start right now. If there is anybody who has an inkling whether she wants to really aspire for political office, let's give them that courage and say, we'll ask the nurses in every county, in every, to vote for you. So with that, thank you very much, and let's all unite and care beyond boundaries. Thank you. I'm, I'm told that now it's time for questions and comments. And I'll also question. Janice, are you the first one or you're just the, okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, nobody wants to be the first. That's not All fair. right. Let's give her a hand. It's not easy to stand up. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Diane Mancino. I'm the executive director of the National Student Nurses Association. We're located in New York. But my question is, uh, keeping the girls in school, what are the policies about um, basic education, elementary education uh, in your country for girls? Because I know, for example, in Kenya, uh, they can have education up until uh, I believe it's high school, and then if they can't pay for their education, mm. they don't continue. Mm. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm part of a fund that somebody has established to try to help pay to keep uh, the girls in school and high school. How is it in Botswana? 
Okay, Bo Botswana is not a good, a good example. I'll, I'll answer it, but I'll, I'll leave out Botswana. Why? Because since 1974, Botswana had free education throughout, from primary school all the way. Remember we got diamonds and we use them profitably. So I'm one of those who benefited from free education all the way to post to university. So even when I came to America, I was on a government scholarship. So let's leave it aside. Right now, I'm battling with a lot of countries where they were following the MDGs. Millennium Development Goal for of, uh, Education actually said the definition of it was at least nine years of education, which was terrible, you know? Now, nine years of education, you know what that means? It means you are coming out at junior high. Immediately after you've passed junior high, the, 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 you know, now your parents have to pay. If they are poor, they cannot afford, you are coming out. And guess what you are? You are a glorified housekeeper. That's all you are. So that that's how come then it, you know, it had its own flaws. So what do I do now? And now it has been rectified under the Sustainable Development Goals, is that it should be education with skills up to post-secondary school. So a lot of our countries now, that's part of what I'm doing, saying to the governments, you need to pay for your students. And when they say, yeah, but it's so expensive, it's, and you say, no, 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 the budget to education, we, we put Botswana as an example where 27% of the budget in Botswana goes to health, to, to education, 22 to health, and only 5% to the military. You know, African governments are arming themselves to the teeth. You wonder what kind of war they're waging. Yet if they could take that and really say military less, they could be able to, 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 to send those kids to school. So that's what I'm spending my time doing. It's not easy to tell a president that your excellency, if you look at your military budget, you could actually take half of it and put it onto education. He looks at you with one of those eyes, but then hey, he's an African woman speaking, so they can't do much. So it's basically that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Elizabeth Crooks. I'm from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm a faculty member. First, I want to congratulate Botswana on their 50th anniversary. Yes. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I have a lot of international students, and um, many of them choose not to go back to mm. their home countries. And yes. I'm at a loss to what to say to them. So could you address healthcare worker migration? And maybe give me some words of wisdom to encourage my international students to go back to low resource <laughs> countries. You know what? They will they were asked you in the first place, what am I going back to? I did all my training here and I was eager to go back to Botswana. Why? Because I knew there were jobs there waiting for me. In fact, after after I graduated my undergrad after I got my undergraduate degree, I had four jobs chasing after me until one of them caught up. But some of them are, <laughs> you know, one of them eventually caught up with me, and you know, I ended up being a, 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 an intern as, uh, uh, you know, at the university, and that's how come, how come I became a lecturer. But for some of them, they don't know if there's a job at home, but they are seeing jobs here. So it, it's a difficult one. I worked with the, as part of the ICN, with the, WHO, they were doing the global um, recruitment and retention of health personnel. Because as you saw in my, one of my slides, there, there's an eight million people shortage of health workers. Now, until we have enough people educated to fill that eight million, the supply and the demand will always, you know, be varied so that it's, it, it's really that. And, but however, the conclusion that, was, uh, that, that we all came up with was actually a global code, which, which was accepted at the World Health Assembly, that all people have the right to migrate or to work where they want. However, where people are on scholarship, you know, the, the receiving countries should ensure that they collaborate with the sending countries 
to, to, to have a, a collaboration in training so that you don't completely wipe up wipe out the, you know, the, 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 the personnel in one country. But it's, it's not easy to enforce because we are talking here countries. But within countries, there are institutions. They, you know, they, 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 they hire and fire as they will. You have institutions, you have healthcare agencies, so it, it, is, a, it is a difficult one. But the, the, the agreement is simply that we need to collaborate and have more healthcare workers educated in order to fill this gap. As long as there's a gap, those people have every right to stay where they are. Yeah. Maybe they'll go home one day, but you know. And maybe when they see some of us, I'm hoping right now I'm talking to somebody who is from Ghana, who is from whatever, who is here and seeing that, oh, she looks okay, she's from home. Okay, maybe there's a job there, I can go, you know. It's really just that we need to inspire them to say, you know, things are okay at home, you can go, there will be a job waiting for you. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, I'm Angela Amar, I'm from Emory University in Atlanta, and thank you very much for this talk, very inspiring. I was particularly interested, I do work in forensic nursing and in violence, and sex workers are often victims and often forgotten victims. Also, I'm intrigued by this idea of transactional sex and how often that occurs and most people aren't aware. So I wonder what are the things you think we should be doing? What should we be teaching students and what should we as nurses be doing that reaches out and helps sex workers? Uh, we're talking sex workers. Hmm? Uh, I missed the, the, the question, but is it about sex work? My question is about what should we be doing you said you hope that we really address more with these forgotten victims and sex workers. So what are things that you think that we should be teaching students and what are things that you think nurses should be doing in regards to that population? Okay, I, I don't know if we should be teaching students. We should be getting a sex worker to come and teach students what they do and what their needs are. So uh, I, I mean, e even when I was a, 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 a professor at the university, I would get a sex worker to come to my class and to you know, educate our people, our, our, our student nurses on their experiences, their expectations, their harassment by the police and what needs to be done. And actually I became a lifelong learner myself in that when I became minister, the first thing I did was to tell the police no harassing anybody. We don't have a law in Botswana against sex work. We have a law that says no loitering. Now, it's very interesting that that loitering applies only to women. Men do loiter, you know. So I simply said, no more such thing as loitering. And we started programs for sex workers by, for and by the sex workers themselves. So because in the ultimate, they are the ones that can really educate what is needed, but uh, on what is needed. But we then would get nurses who are more I mean, let's face it, we all have our own little beliefs and all that, and religion sometimes interferes with that. But we're able to get to see nurses, to get nurses who are, who are more able to work with sex workers and be able to ensure that they have the supplies, the whatever. But in the ultimate, the people who know themselves are the sex workers themselves. So they, they were in the lead and were only supported by the nursing, you know, nursing personnel. And, and, and let me add to say that right now, one of the things that I'm doing with um, uh, the governments of the 20, well, it's really 21 countries, but it ends, up, it ends up being 24 because we have the Indian Ocean Islands, is to work uh, in any one country. When I say I, I want to, to, when I arrive in a country, I want to meet sex workers. I'll say I want to meet all NGOs, including those of the marginalized uh, populations. And then I say, in there, I also want to meet the faith-based organizations. And uh, it's a very nice meeting where you have men of the cloth and uh, with men, we have sex with men and with sex workers. And I start by, say, by sharing, saying, yeah, do you all know each other? <laughs> <laughs> And it's interesting that some sex workers will say, yeah, we know them. 
as in the Bible, and I say, right, now that we saw that one, these are part of your congregation, men of the cloth, what are you doing in terms of assisting them in accessing services and healthcare? And that breaks the ice. Of course, most of the time it's not easy, but we start from there to say, they are here, they are your congregation, they are your people, Christ said, love one another. And start with them. Hello, over this way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Terry Valiga from Duke University in North Carolina. Uh, thank you for Listen, your- I, I have to do this because I have lights beaming, so okay, I can okay. see you. <laughs> thank you for your comments. I think they were sobering and challenging, uh, but hopeful and inspiring, so I thank you. And I'd like to kind of extend a little bit of the question that preceded, not focusing on a particular population or vulnerable, vulnerable group, but your thoughts, aside from bringing into the classroom uh, individuals who are dealing with certain health situations or social, social situations, what else would you say we need to do in nursing education to prepare the kind of risk takers, leaders, um, people who just get under the skin of others to make things happen? What do we need to do in our nursing education programs um, that will allow that to happen. And I think it's more, personally, than preparing researchers in PhD programs, because there's too few of them. Certainly that's needed. But in our basic programs, what do we need to do to prepare the kind of leaders and risk takers that you clearly say are needed to make these things happen? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I, I guess, you know what, it, it, it depends on the amount of um, funding that you'd, you'd get. I mean, exposure globally would entail sometimes having to take students outside. However, the most important one and the easiest one is to ensure that we take our students out of the hospitals and clinics more into the community. You know, at community level, our students meet all sorts of people and they can actually be able to therefore go and give uh, you know, care. I mean, what would be wrong with somebody being assigned to go and work with sex workers in their environment where you know, they, they get there, they're sharing information, let's say, on you know, how they can access health, health services, uh, on condom use, on things like that. Just to put a stu students there for a week, that's a very great learning experience. It's not like they'll teach them how to be sex workers. That's never taught. But half the time we are thinking, eee, those kinds of people. But you see, we need to educate our students to know that in communities we have you know, some people that are marginalized. We have these great people, and therefore we can take them to the crash where they can see uh, you know, children. I mean, I, I, I know we, were, we, were, we, we used to be taken even to, um, we'd be assigned to the, 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 the nursery schools. And that, that was good. That was a good form of pediatric nursing. That didn't entail you having to be in a pediatric ward and necessarily seeing children who are, you know, in, 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 in those circumstances. By the time you go to the ward, you actually have now a perspective of what children, you know, are like. It was really great. Yeah. So with that, I think I want to recognize a, a lady I went to school with, uh, Titi Taylor, right here. Uh, Dillard nursing really exposed her to a lot of, uh, you know, outside the hospital uh, clinic environment care. And I think that's what opened us up to say, we want to now be in public health or, or community health. So, Titi, over to you, yeah, it's, it's good to see you. <laughs> we have one here. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Kay from Liberty University and I teach global health to DNP students. And um, I was really glad that you mentioned um, female genital mutilation. Um, because I, it's a problem that's starting to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was just recently in England and noticed that there were billboards educating uh, men about mm -hmm. protecting women from mm -hmm. female genital mutilation. Could you address that, please? Okay, yeah. You know what? In the ultimate, a lot of the things that happen to the girl child when you ask why is it happening, 
they'll say so that she can get married. It's always to please somebody other than herself, and usually the male. So that now, as part of the United Nations, UN Women has come up with a slogan that they call He for She. It's a campaign where you know, you're looking at how do men become decision makers, but decision makers for their own health too, but also for the health of their families. So, for example, right now in the AIDS field, we are finding that a lot of men don't come for testing. They test through their wives. Somebody will say to the wife, oh, did you take a test? And you say, yeah, an HIV test, yeah. Okay, you, are you negative? Yeah. If you are negative, I'm also negative. You know, because you know, being sick in any one setting, whether it's African or whatever, is definitely not masculine. So it's really to try and push men to say, look, health decisions are in your hands, but they should be also for yourself as well as for others. So that it's really now time to educate to them. If you educate them on the, the dangers of female genital mutilation, I can see where a father, a lot of fathers actually have stood up and said, I don't want my children to have anything done to, you know, for them. That's the way we, we, we tackled it in countries like, like in my region, the countries that have that are Kenya, Uganda. Uh, a little bit of Burundi, but it's, it's really Kenya, Uganda. And we, it is only when we involved men that we were actually seeing uh, the, 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 the problem you know, go down because you can outlaw. You know, people always say, oh, there should be a law against it. Laws are laws, but they need to be domesticated at community level. Otherwise, they're exactly that pieces of paper. So it's really educating the men, the grandparents, and everybody to say that is no longer relevant. And in any event, in this global world that we live in, who told you that these children are going to be married to Kenyans? They could be married to Belgians, to whatever, you know, to, to Americans. So really, you know, you don't want an American to run away after looking at your daughter and find that the parts are missing, right? So anyway, but it's, it's really that, yeah. So I think I've been told that I have only one more question. So you are the chief. In my country, say the last to eat is the chief. You are the chief. I'm the chief, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. I received that. Thank you very much, Dr. Tolo, for your bold uh, presentation. I'm Maxine Adig Bowler from University of Texas, Arlington. And I just want you to comment on how do you balance what is culture versus what is good in quotation, healthcare delivery. And I'm, if, if it's not clear, I can rephrase the question. How do you balance culture and healthcare delivery? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess the first thing that we need to know is that culture is very dynamic. It's not static. That's the first thing I usually say when I meet some of those old men and women to say, look guys, uh, in the olden days of Botswana, for example, you all wore skins. Cloth came, you never said it's not part of our culture. You started wearing suits and clothes and all that. Therefore, let's ensure that everything that is cultural becomes relevant to the, you know, to the present where we are. So let that culture be dynamic. That's the first thing. Once they've understood that, you are then able to say to them, what are some of our cultural practices that you will see as beneficial? And which ones do you see as harmful? It's very interesting how they actually let them come out very quickly. And you are able to say, what do we do then with the ones that are beneficial? And what do, how do you help us to get rid of the ones that are uh, har harmful? And that's the way we did it in Malawi. And those chiefs simply said, in our communities, just because we married 14 year old, does not mean that it has to continue. These children should be in school in this day and age of the monetary economy. We cannot afford to waste one more mind. And that's how they, they were able to just say, we're outlawing. And it's better when it's outlawed at community level by a chief than at government level by the law, because the law is the law, as I said, 
it has to be implemented at community level. So it, 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 it's basically that, to teach and to make sure that people you know, do understand why that culture has to go and we have to move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.